if you have MS, should you start with medication that's conservative with a low risk of serious immunosuppression and side effects and only take a stronger medication if necessary? Or should you hit it hard right away and accept the risk of immunosuppression, infection, and other complications to get the disease under control? Well, according to this review article, 11 out of 11 observational studies all of them come to the same conclusion that one approach is better. Let's look at the data. So this is an approximate ranking of the efficacy of the strength of different disease-modifying therapies for multiple sclerosis, and I compiled this using various head-to-head -head trials. Now, a lot of these medications haven't been compared against one another, so take this with a grain of salt, but many people believe that hematopoietic stem cell transplant is highly effective, perhaps the most effective disease-modifying therapy, Lemtrada or alemtuzumab, also very strong, but this is a medication that depletes lymphocytes, B and T cells, can cause infections, infusion reactions, and even secondary autoimmune diseases such as autoimmune thyroid disease. The B cell depleters, also very strong, ranked third here, Ocrevus, Casimta, Rituximab, Briumvi, along with Novantrone and Tysabri and Mavenclad or Cladribine. But these medications all have risks of serious side effects. The B cell depleters can cause infections. We know Novantrone can cause heart failure and even a rare form of leukemia. And Tysabri can cause the feared infection by the JC virus, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy encephalopathy or PML. Some people believe the S1P receptor modulators, Gelenia, Mazen, and Zaposia are moderately effective, perhaps better than some of the oral agents and the beta interferons and glutirimer. But the thing about this list overall is that there's a correlation between the efficacy of medications and the safety. Of course, the drugs on top, they can potentially cause serious infections, whereas, say, beta interferon formulations like beta serum or Avonex, Rebif, Extavia, or Glutirimer acetate formulations, Copaxone, and Glatopa don't significantly increase the risk of infections, so people with MS are faced with this trade-off. And the old school thinking is the idea of escalation therapy. You start with a conservative approach. If it doesn't work, you have a relapse or you have new lesions on MRI, you take a stronger medication. However, there's this newer idea of induction therapy of just accepting the additional risk and taking a stronger medication right away. A few caveats before I show the data. One is please talk to your own provider for personalized advice because everyone's different and people have different susceptibilities to complications and infections. And also different doctors have different opinions on this complicated topic. Also, I'm really only focused on the efficacy medications and I am in fact going to show that the stronger medications are better overall in changing the prognosis of MS, but I'm not talking about side effects, so the benefit versus versus risk still has to be weighed and may be different for each individual, and different people also have different preference for their individual risk tolerance. Also, I'm not really gonna get into the baseline characteristics of the people in these studies, but they primarily represent people who are younger, say age 18 to 55, who have relatively newly diagnosed relapsing multiple sclerosis. It doesn't necessarily apply to older people or people with progressive multiple sclerosis. We just don't have as much data on that topic. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday. So we'll start with this study from Finland, and this is from the Finnish MS Registry. Now, ideally, you would have a randomized trial. You would take people newly diagnosed with MS and randomize them to get a stronger drug or a weaker drug and then follow them for many years. Unfortunately, we don't have that data. More on randomized trials later on. But what they do is called propensity matching. So there could be some biases over which individuals choose the stronger medications versus the weaker medications, but they take this huge population of people with MS and take 66 people who are on the stronger medications with similar baseline characteristics to another 66 people on weaker medications. In other words, they're similar in age, existing medical comorbidities, baseline disability, MRI findings, recent relapses, that kind of thing. So they should have roughly the same predisposition to having a certain multiple sclerosis prognosis going forward. Of course, this is not as accurate as a randomized trial. So they looked at highly effective disease modifying 
therapies in one group. These are people who receive Tysabri, a once a month infusion, Lemtrada or Alemtuzumab, and two B cell depleting medications, Ocrevus and Rituximab, versus moderately effective disease modifying therapies, including interferon beta formulations such as Rebif, Extavia, Beta Ceron, Avidex, and Plegrity, the pills, Abagio, and Tecfidera and glatiramer acetate formulations, copaxone and glatopa, and they compared them against each other. And the people taking the stronger medications did better. This graph looks at six month confirmed disability progression. What that means is they measure disability on a scale called EDSS or expanded disability status scale. And they looked at people who got worse and they confirmed that they were actually worse and it wasn't just random fluctuation or measurement error because they were also still worse on a follow up exam examination. And you can see the number of people who had confirmed disability progression taking the moderately effective disease modifying therapies in the blue line was 47% at the end of the study versus 28.4% the red line for people taking the stronger medications. Also, the percentage of people who had at least one relapse after five years was less, 34.6% in people taking the stronger drugs versus 47.2% more taking the moderately effective drugs. And you can see the p-values are statistically significant. Here's a similar study from Norway. They didn't do propensity matching, so perhaps it's a little bit more biased. There's a slight difference in the disease modifying therapy. They included gelenia in the highly effective therapy this is probably less effective than drugs such as Tysabri, Lemtrada, and B-cell depleters based on observational studies. However, it was superior to Avinex, one of the beta interferons, in a head-to-head -head trial, so I think they wanted to separate it from the less effective therapies. And again, the stronger drugs perform better. Here they looked at no evidence of disease activity. This means no clinical relapses, no new lesions on MRI scan, and no progression of disability. And you can see Abagio, or teraflunamide didn't perform well, and they looked at the odds ratio of achieving no evidence of disease activity. And Tecfidero or dimethylfumarate and Gelenia were about twice as likely to be associated with NIDA, whereas Lemtrada and Tysabri were about four to seven times more likely to be associated with NIDA. And overall, no evidence of disease activity after two years was seen in 52.4% of people taking the stronger drugs versus only 19.4% taking the weaker drugs, and it was highly statistically significant, p-value less than 0.001. So realistically, with the weaker drugs, you're most likely not going to be completely stable. We move to Argentina. This is a retrospective study, and they did do propensity matching, again, correcting for differences in baseline characteristics. Here, they moved Gelenia, the pill, to the weaker category. So the early high-efficacy treatments, Tysabri, Ocrevus, Rituximab, Lumtrada, Novantrone, and and Mavenclad or cladribine, and the escalation therapy, again, starting with the weaker agent and only changing to a stronger medication if necessary, if someone has failed treatment. And many of these individuals may have, in fact, changed to a stronger medication later on. This only refers to the initial choice of therapy. So it's not like we're comparing five years of stronger drug versus five years of weaker drug. In many cases, it may only be a difference of the first one or two years years of treatment. Of course, it varies for each individual. They included Gelenia along with the other pills, Tecfidera, Abagio, and the injectables, interferon beta formulations, and glatiramer acetate formulations. So again, Gelenia is really a moderately or intermediately effective drug, and so it's in different categories in different studies. There were 112 people, and people taking the stronger drugs first did better with 38% less disability progression, 34% fewer relapses lapses and 45% less new MRI activity. Italy will join the party and they have the best data of all in my opinion. They have a huge sample size, 363 in each group and they did do propensity matching, comparing baseline characteristics so they're roughly equal and a pretty long follow-up, median of 8.5 years. For the stronger medications, what they call early intensive treatment, they did include 
Gilenia, along with the usual suspects. And for the weaker drugs, exclation therapy, they also included Imuran azathioprine. This is an old off-patent immunosuppressant, not widely used for multiple sclerosis in the United States, but it does have evidence, though it's lower in efficacy. Here you see the escalation group, the weaker drugs in the left column, and people getting the stronger medications, early intensive therapy on the right side. This is their level of disability using the EDSS scale I mentioned earlier at baseline. It was slightly higher, 2.52 in the escalation group, versus slightly lower 2.45 and people getting the stronger drugs. So we have to account from that. And you can see over a 10 year period, the disability levels diverge slowly. By the end, after 10 years, the mean EDSS was 3.81 in people getting the weaker drugs versus 3.07 in people getting the stronger drugs, accounting for the slight change at baseline. That's a difference of 0.67, a very clinically significant difference and we can see it in graphical form. They start off with roughly equal levels of disability and they slowly diverge over time. And again, keep in mind, this is not 10 years of strong drug versus 10 years of weaker drug. In many cases, it's a short amount of time on the weaker drugs, but it could make a difference later on. This is known as therapeutic lag, and this is very impressive in my opinion. Finally, we have a battle of countries, Sweden versus Denmark. These are two similar countries countries that have a similar socioeconomic class, both have nationalized healthcare, but there's a difference in style of treating MS. Sweden was more aggressive. Only 65% were on low or moderately effective disease modifying therapy, whereas the Danes, it was almost everyone. 92% started on the weaker agents. Will this lead to a difference in outcomes years down the line? If we look at individual medications, we can see the Danes on the left and the Swedes on the right. You can see there are huge sample sizes, N equals 2061 for Denmark, 2700 in Sweden. The Danes like Abagio, 42% of people starting on this medication. They also prescribe a little bit more beta interferon and glutaramer acetate, whereas in Sweden, medications like Gelenia, Tysabri, Rituximab, and even Tecfidera, which is really lower in efficacy, are more commonly prescribed. And this seemed to work out better for Sweden. Here you can see the proportion of people who are free of progression of disability. Sweden, the yellow top line, they had less disability than Denmark, which had more disability. If you look at the numbers, there was 29% less confirmed disability progression in Sweden compared to Denmark. Also looking at individual disability milestones, 24% fewer people in Sweden reached EDSS of three, which is sort of mild to moderate disability, and 25% fewer people reached EDSS of four or moderate disability. The Swedes also had less relapses. You can see this is the proportion who are free of relapses during the study. It starts off at 100%. And then more people remained relapse free, the yellow line is Sweden, than the people in Denmark, the gray line. So I showed you five studies. There are six more studies, and you can certainly read the publication in full in the notes below if you want, but I'll save you some time. They all show the exact same thing in different ways in different countries. The stronger medications are better and seem to have a more favorable result on the prognosis of multiple sclerosis. There are also two ongoing randomized trials, certainly a better methodology than anything I showed you here. The TREAT MS trial, principal investigator Dr. Ellen Mowry from Johns Hopkins, and also the DELIVER MS with famous Twitter neurologist Dr. Daniel Antoneda. I strongly suspect these trials will recapitulate these results, though I've been wrong before. Before. And if I haven't made it clear already, it is my opinion that these authors are correct that the stronger medications are superior and alter the prognosis of MS favorably. And I would say for most younger people with relapsing MS, the benefits likely outweigh the risk. Of course, that may not apply to every single individual. That being said, some of these stronger medications do have very significant risks and I've seen many complications of multiple sclerosis disease modifying therapies in my career, nothing to be played with. I'd be interested to know, did you start with a stronger medication? Was that a good decision? Did it work out well for you? Or did you go with escalation therapy? And would you make a different decision if you knew what you know now? And let me know if you have ideas for other videos.